welcome. This is a breakthrough moment because we're not here to talk about religion. We'll never agree on the differences of religion. In fact, if you're like me, you kind of like had enough. So I don't want to talk about religion. My name is Jose Rojas. We really do need a breakthrough for our personal lives. So we're going to talk about God, how to get to know Him personally as your Lord and Savior, experiencing the breakthrough together. It's not what you know, it's who you know. We're going to get to know Him better. It's a breakthrough. Welcome back to another of the series of the breakthrough moments of life. We have this week, in a simple way, confronted the issue of religion versus faith. Religion means I agree with you, you disagree with me, or we agree to disagree. You, you know, you never know where religion will take you. And there are so many differences, it's impossible to conclude such debates. But faith, you cannot argue. Because faith is born of experience. When you've experienced something, that's very different than a debate because you know by evidence in your own experience that something important has happened. So in this series, the Breakthrough Series, we have simply looked at who God is and Jesus Christ whom He sent. It's not a debate. This week we have literally looked in simple ways at how you can come to know Him better. The Tacoma, Seattle area in these United States of America is the closest to Germany and Britain that you get. It's a society that works hard. There's a strong work ethic. There are folks who are doing their best and religion has fallen to not second, third or fourth place for many people in highest proportions in this part of the country than anywhere else on this continent. Folks have simply decided religion is not for them. And so what fascinated us in this research is that we found not only is religion not important, but at the same time, spirituality is. So I, I, obviously it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy. Uh, I'm not interested in religion, but I'm fascinated by spiritual things. Hollywood is similar. Remember when we were little, a vampire was a bad thing. It was scary. Uh, um, now there are good vampires and bad vampires. I never knew you could do that, but you can try it because it's a, it's a trek into spirituality. You, you also have the good and the bad side of the force. There, there is a recognition of a divinity. It's just you can't define it, and you can choose the good side or the bad side of it. But the part that everybody can have in common in that journey is that you don't have a savior, someone who saves you personally. And, and so we looked in this series at the frontal lobe. We looked at the physiological function of the brain. Just looking at it from a scientific perspective, here is where your reasoning occurs, here's where right or wrong, ethical, unethical, moral, immoral, your alpha waves on a brain scanner are right here. And your beta waves are your temporal lobes, the back of your brain. So your reasoning occurs here. And, and that's, this is where people's conscience is. And when you look at the data, the research shows conclusively that many people suffer from guilt. So much of the violence, uh, 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 crimes of passion, guilt is associated. You, you, were, you, were, you were abused throughout your childhood. You repeat it in your adulthood. And you find that right here in the frontal lobe, people suffer a lot. Like the kid who came up to me and said, Pastor, i got to talk to you. All right, man. And you think you can handle anything a teenager has to say? I, I told the kid, yeah, man, what? He says, well, I don't know, like, what to do. All right, what happened? I shot two dudes last night. And you just tried to pretend not to be shot. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. I got a big question. Are they alive? I don't know. I capped off a few on each one, and then I ran. Uh, how old are you, son? I'm 14 now. I'm a man. So what's going through this young man's frontal lobe? You see the power of what had, this is overstating it with a real case. I said, now, what does your conscience say you need to do? 
Sounds like uh, I need to turn myself in. Yeah, man. Let's go talk to your parents, and I'll go in with you. We'll be with you, but you have to turn yourself in. I guess so. Now, that's over a strong case. But let's look at similar situations, but in a much less dramatic way. We carry guilt. And in, in Isaiah, God says, chapter 1, verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Let's frontal lobe this thing. Give me your attention for a moment. If your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I will cleanse your conscience. That's a physiological reality. That's a rush of dopamine. That's an increase of adrenaline. You suddenly can be relieved of your guilt. And I thought it was just, okay, he forgave me, but I don't feel anything. No, 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 no. When you have been relieved of guilt, that's a physiological reality. Physicians will tell you, even blood pressure will drop when you've dealt with your guilt. Have you ever been forgiven? Has a judge ever forgiven you? Oh, you see what it does to your frontal lobe? And that's the power of what God wants to do literally, experientially in your life. That is not a theological debate. That is not based on Greek and Hebrew. That is based on an experience directly with God. Give me a break. I kind of get excited. I'm sorry. And see, the power of this series is that we see the paradigm flipped. I thought it was me who's supposed to look for God. You know, like, man, you need religion, man. No, 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 no. It's God who looks for us. He's the one who takes the initiative. In fact, we're the ones who don't want him. And I want to briefly tonight on this last of the breakthrough series tell you a story about a guy that God wanted to reach that God loved so much that he didn't give up trying to reach him now when God reaches us he blesses us he forgives us and becomes a constant companion friend no that doesn't mean you turn into a weirdo I, I don't think I'm that weird although others will debate violently but you know what? Having the Lord in my life doesn't make me better than anyone else. It just gives me something I can give away. There's some peace. There's a blessing in my life. I can't explain it to you. I just experience it. I'm no better than anyone. I'm not anything special. But I know that I'm special to Him. He found me. I wrote a book. God found me in Los Angeles. He found me. I've heard people say, you know, when I found God, liar, you didn't find him. Look at you. Look at you bragging it up. When I found God, you know, Jesus told the story of, of, a, of a guy who had a hundred sheep. And one of his sheep got lost. And, and he left the ninety and nine and went to find the one lost sheep. I don't think a lost sheep could say, I found God. <laughs> it's he who finds us. And I think that's awesome because I don't know how to find God, but he always knows how to find me. Ooh, I get excited. The story is found in the book of Daniel, chapters 1 to 4. The guy's name was Nebuchadnezzar. Can you say that fast three times? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon. The capital city of Babylon is now called Baghdad. The ruins are still just outside of town there next to the Euphrates River. Nebuchadnezzar was a brilliant general. He began as a warrior. His method was to destroy the nation, to kill everybody. Men, women, children, even the dog didn't get away. But then they'd go to the palace and he would take young men 
of royal lineage to come back and be educated in the leading universities of the day, the universities of Babylon, so that they can serve the king. And this is quite a strategy. You conquer the nation and you got members of the royal family of every nation you conquered serving you in the palace. That's brilliant political strategy. So not only is this man a general, he also knows the political skill of leadership. And when Israel was destroyed and Solomon's glorious temple was destroyed and they scraped the gold off the walls and they took the treasure that King Hezekiah had mistakenly shown to Babylonian ambassadors years earlier, they pillaged the nation and they grabbed of the royal lineage men who had to be handsome, young, strapping, you know, the shoulder people. The green eyes and the, the, the hair that waves in the breeze, which means I would have been killed when they came through. <laughs> when they handed out looks, I missed the meeting. You know, I, uh, I heard about it only afterwards. It was too late. <laughs> These guys were brought back to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was unmistakably the greatest man on planet Earth during that time in history. A powerful nation with the most advanced military techniques, the introduction of the two-edged sword, because everybody else had like a machete type of sword that cuts one way, but the double-edged sword can go both directions, which means if you're the enemy, you're in trouble. Nebuchadnezzar was a great man, and God wanted to reach him. In chapter 1 of Daniel, we see four guys, teenagers from Israel, who are now captives and to be made eunuchs in the, president, in the, the king's uh, palace to serve the king. And they're going to be attending university so they can learn all the ways of Babylon. They're Israeli names. Uh, one was uh, uh, um, uh, Belshazzar, it, it, who is what God is, and, and his name is changed to Daniel, who is what Aku is. So all their names that meant something to the God of Israel is now changed to the gods of Babylon. Gonna, he's going to start with their minds. He's going to indoctrinate them with new ideas, and they will be educated, and then they will serve the king in managing the areas of Israel while he has royal people here to help him with that. And in chapter 1, they were given the good news by Aspenaz, the leader of the eunuchs. You guys are going to eat the king's own food. And when they saw what the king ate, let's just say they freaked out. Stuff was still moving. <laughs> and it wasn't high in protein either. It was just alive. And they said, what is this? Oh, it's what the king eats, man. You guys are lucky. We don't eat this stuff. What do you guys eat? Legumes. You know what legumes are? Beans. You know these guys were Mexicans. <laughs> Scripture says they were good men. They had to be Mexicans. I just have my thoughts. I'm just thinking out loud. Legumes. We want water. Legumes. That's nuts, grains. I had to better expand it to be appropriate and complete. Thank you. Lentils. Thank you. Uh, lentil soup is serious. It's, it's always pea soup, but that's not a legume. The power of a vegetarian diet. And instead of the stuff he was drinking, who knows what it was, they drank water. And they told Aspenaz, look. They didn't say, uh, by the way, our church prohibits these things. They didn't say that. They said, we take care of our bodies. You know, we work out, we do stuff, and we don't eat this stuff. We like to eat legumes and drink water. You know, too many people think religiously when they hear a statement like that. A church that doesn't let you do this. Half of Hollywood is vegan. These guys, don't, many of them don't even believe in God. And they're vegan and proud of it. They get on Oprah Winfrey, yes, I eat weeds. <laughs> and I'm very healthy. Why? When a church brings up taking care of your body, is it embarrassing that the religion doesn't let you do anything? Taking care of your body is a good thing. 
Because if this body is functioning well, then you have pure blood with good protein levels, with proper oxygenation, reaching your brain and in creating stuff that God can reach you even greater. Now you can give away to the world with increased knowledge. Imagine being healthy. Now that's a novel idea. Prevention instead of having to correct all the disease that my bad lifestyle caused. Now, this isn't intended to make anyone feel bad. I, I, I'm saying this with great respect, but I'm arguing the point that taking care of your body doesn't have to be something bogged down by religion. God wanted to reach Nebuchadnezzar through a message of healthful living. So the guys told Aspenaz, okay, like, give us 10 days and we'll eat our stuff. After that, because Aspenaz says, if you guys get pale and skinny, he'll have my head. And that's what a king can order you killed, just like that. And so, so they, he agreed. He gave them 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they had better color. Their eyes were brighter. The other guys had indigestion. Stuff was going on in the bathroom. They weren't feeling well at all. I'm serious. They were not feeling well at all. And these guys were all healthy with a carrot stick. I don't go work out. See you guys at the gym. It's powerful. Then they went to school. Guess what happened? They got grades 10 times higher than all the other guys in the palace. 10 times higher just by staying on their healthful diet and a healthful lifestyle. The king heard about it. I thought 4.0 was already serious. What is it to have a 40.0? That means you took all your required coursework and got straight A's, and then you took 10 times. I mean, that's a true geekhood experience. <laughs> Students are like, oh, that guy, those guys needed counseling, man. <laughs> 10 times wiser. Wiser is different than smarter. Not only were they smarter with higher grades, Wisdom is also to be able to see what is not obvious. Wisdom is different. It comes from the Lord. And so the, the king himself said, i got to interview these boys. He brought them in. I heard you guys are it. Well, no, sir, the Lord is it. And he has seen fit to bless us. We just like took care of our bodies and studied hard. And he questioned them. And in all things... They were wiser than all of his chamber of wise men, counselors, soothsayers, Chaldeans, musicians, and others who advised the king. Imagine bringing in an orchestra just because you need advice on a political issue. Now, we're going to sing two stanzas, then you can consider your decision. That was kind of different. These guys were wiser, sharper, brilliant. You see, taking care of your body doesn't have to be uncool. It could actually be a blessing. And so the king said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, for they ate the right foods. I could see that they're smarter and they're wiser. He did everything except say, I accept them. But he did recognize, this is pretty cool, man. Okay, you guys are like, wow. And that's how it is in society today. People can recognize that a church might have their, a point at this. This is great, but uh, I'm not religious, so the king did not accept God. God was trying to reach him. So then you get to chapter 2 of Daniel. The king had a nightmare. Do you have those? Why are you eating beans after 11 o'clock at night? <laughs> Who told you to have such a big heavy meal? Who told you to have three bananas and a big glass of milk at 11 p.m.? Because if you have all that digestion going on right here, less oxygenated blood's getting to your brain because it's all down here for digestion, that's a good recipe for a nightmare, a, a delicious one. <laughs> and the king rolled, screamed, he woke up in a sweat. And all of his soothsayers, Chaldeans, musicians, advisors, everybody was called in. O oh, king, live forever. That's the only greeting you could give the king. O oh, king, live forever. It's kind of like the president of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Are you aware? That's the only thing you could tell him. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. He could tell you, you're ugly. 
Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> you get up to leave in the meal. Thank you, Mr. President. You're always thanking this guy, even if he didn't do anything. <laughs> but it's called protocol. Thank you, Mr. President. That's the. Don't try any other things. Those, those guys with the curly cues coming out of their ears. Thank you, Mr. President. You just feel impressed. That's the only thing you can say. With the king, it was, oh, king, live forever. Even if you don't want him to. <laughs> king, live forever. That was the protocol. Oh, king, live forever. It's 3.30 in the morning. Well, I had a dream. You guys are going to take care of him. Oh, king, live forever. We talk with the gods. We have direct communication with the gods of wood, of stone, of gold, and of silver. Just tell us the dream, O king, and we'll give you the interpretation. That's the point. I forgot it. Isn't that awful on Sunday morning? You go to breakfast. What was that last night? I had a nightmare. It was terrible. What was it about? I don't know. I forgot. See, because it was a short-term memory thing, it never did get into your long-term memory bank, which is a different part of the brain. So neurophysiologically, it did not register. All you remember is that you freaked out and woke up in a cold sweat. And so the king says, you guys tell me the dream. I know it was important. Oh, king, live forever. Nobody can tell the king what he dreamt upon his bed. Only the gods. Yes, you guys told me you can talk to the gods, so get to it. Oh, oh, king, live forever. And they've got bones and ashes and lizard tail powder, and they started dancing. What do we do? I don't know. <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> and, by, and the others were singing all 20 stanzas over here, and others were praying over here. Uh, oh, king, live forever. <laughs> and I hope we do too. <laughs> There, we don't know what you dreamt, O king. Give us the dream and its interpretation. But you guys told me you can talk to the gods. I want these men killed. I want their bodies cut in pieces. I want them taken back to the house and destroy the house with the family still in it. The whole family of all of these people was to be executed. You know, that it was still the tradition until recently in Babylon. During Desert Storm, one of the generals, one of the Air Force generals of Saddam Hussein had been talking quietly to the West. And Saddam Hussein discovered this through his intelligence network, which was very, very tight. Right there in the bunker, he shot and killed the man, had his body cut in pieces and put in a plastic bag. To the horror of the family, they arrived at the house, brought the pieces in, sealed the house with the whole family in it, and they blew it up. Exactly as it had been done thousands of years earlier. Take them! Cut their bodies into pieces and destroy the house with the whole family in it. And they, they had not called Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't wake them up because they were jealous that they were the wisest of the wise guys. And so they were still sleeping. And when the general arrived, he says, I have orders to kill you guys. Run for your lives. Wait, wait, what's going on? The king, he's mad because, and they told him the whole story. Well, take us before the king, says Daniel. I don't think he wants to see you guys. Hey, if we, you know, if we're going to die, take us. There is a God in heaven who revealeth secrets, even what the king has been dreaming on his bed. And so he came before the king. Oh, king, live forever. It's a quarter to 5 a.m. I had this dream. And he started the whole thing again. Can you tell me, Daniel? You guys are the smart ones. Uh, no, we can't. I knew it. But there is a God in heaven who can. Amen. If you give me 24 hours to consult with my God. Oh, you're stalling. You're going to buy time so you can flee the city. O king, live forever. I promise the Lord will reveal. So he gave, everybody was saved because of these four kids again. And so now he went and had the same nightmare. Poor Daniel. <laughs> he wakes up in a cold sweat. Hurry before I forget it. Let's go see the king. And in the early morning, they wake up the king. O king, live forever. Can you tell me what I dreamt? No, O king. 
but the Lord can. You, you were laying on your bed. Behold, O king, you saw a statue that reached up into the heavens. Its head disappeared into the clouds. And I remember when I used to stand at the base of the Twin Towers in the World Trade Center in New York, the two towers would just disappear in the clouds above. I remember standing there all the time between them and, and marveling, remembering that statue as, as Nebuchadnezzar is describing it. It had the most bizarre, beautiful head of gold, the strangest chest and arms of silver, thighs of brass and long legs of iron and some weird feet of iron and clay that just don't kind of mix. It kind of looks like a, a serious case of athlete's foot <laughs> with an iron oxide component. And so he says in the middle of the dream, as I'm still standing there, a gigantic boulder cut not by a human hand means it was cut by God's hand. This giant boulder, a meteorite, <laughs> destroys the statue. And as it's falling around him, September 11, I was supposed to be in the North Tower. My wife made me stay home and help with the house. So September 12, the next morning, I was helping with the volunteer effort at Ground Zero. What was it like to be standing there when these towers are falling? Can you see why Nebuchadnezzar was overwhelmed? In his dream, he stood there as this massive statue was falling around him, a cloud of dust that choked him, that scared him. And they didn't have anything tall back then. And then the giant boulder crushed everything to powder, and a giant wind blew it all away. That's it. In all of its detail, that's what I dreamt. And then Daniel says, here is the interpretation, O king, live forever. You, sir, are that head of gold. Me? Gold? The head that controls the body? The most precious metal? Yes. And that's who you are. You're a mighty kingdom like gold is the mightiest of all. But after you, what do you mean after me? My kingdom is eternal. Oh, king, live forever. But your kingdom's not going to live forever. You might, but the kingdom, anyway. <laughs> Another kingdom weaker than you, inferior to you like silver is inferior to gold, will take over. That's the Medes and the Persians. The Iranians took them over. After that, then another kingdom after that, the, 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 the brass kingdom, the Greeks, Alexander the Great took over after that. And then a giant, long, mighty kingdom of iron. Of, and the kingdom of iron, everyone knows, is the Roman Empire that lasted, what, 1,200 years? And then finally, the last kingdoms, like ten toes, there'll be ten kingdoms, like iron and clay, they just don't, they talk about peace, but they just don't get along. That's at the end of time, for then God will send his son, and he will finish with the kingdoms as we know them. And that rock that grew after the powder blew away and took over the earth will be the kingdom of God coming to be among us. So you see, now God is wanting to reach Nebuchadnezzar through what is called prophecy, letting him know what's coming. Because God doesn't want you to say, I didn't know. No one told me. He wants you to be aware. This stuff will happen in a way that you had not imagined. It's what he foresaw, and he's letting you know. And Nebuchadnezzar was so inspired God is reaching out to him through prophecy. He says, blessed be the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Bring me the silver chain. Only one guy wore a silver chain, the prime minister. He declares Daniel prime minister of Babylon. Probably the youngest prime minister. How old are you, son? I'm 21, and we'll take care of business. Prime minister of Babylon. And the three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all young people also, became governors of the three largest uh, states, uh, provinces of the kingdom. So now they're governorships, three of them, and one prime minister. And everything except, I accept the God of heaven who's trying to reach me. 
He's, he's, take, he's showing me, he's tried to reach me through a health message. It was very nice. I was very impressed, but I don't accept. He's wanting to reach me now through prophecy. Oh, that's fantastic. It's nice to know in advance. I'm going to even uh, benefit the guys who brought me the good news and, and, and promote them politically. But he did not accept God. So in the third chapter of Daniel, you could see he had time to think about that head of gold. What do you mean a head of gold? He made a gigantic statue 60 cubits high of pure gold. And it looked just like him. It was very common back then for a king to declare themselves a deity. The Caesars thought they were deities. The pharaohs of Egypt thought they were a god. And now maybe he can introduce deity to the Babylonian journey. And he made 60 cubits. A cubit was from your elbow, a man's elbow to his hand. And of course, uh, if you go by the Rojasian hand, that's a foot and a half. So other hands might be, you know, some of these taller guys. Anyway, if it's a foot and a half times 60, that's a 90-foot statue of pure gold. Most of it taken from the Israelis when they destroyed Jerusalem that Solomon had brought together in his treasure. And then he called all the leaders of the world to come and worship the new God. We know Daniel must have been away on, on business because he wasn't there, but the three big governors were there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was this gigantic congregation on the plain of Dura, Dura, which means hard in Spanish. It must have been a very hard plain. And they have this statue. They have, a, they have an orchestra over here, and Nebuchadnezzar announced, okay, we're going to have a worship service. When you hear the musicians play, everyone fall on your face and worship the new God. If somebody is not in the mood to worship, we have these ovens over here. We'll cook you. <laughs> Any questions? No, sir. Live forever. So then the music played, and everybody... Dust was rising as they all worshipped the new god of Babylon. And finally a general comes to the king. Oh, king, live forever. What? There are three men of the captives of Israel who have not obeyed the king. What? What do you mean? And he looks back there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, my boys. The smartest of the wise guys. The governors of my three top provinces. Bring them over here. How dare they? Because they were just standing there. You know, they're not going to worship this statue. They worship God. You don't need another God when you already hang out with the, the real thing. Amen. So you already got your stuff together. You don't need a rock. You don't need a metal. You don't need a wood. You don't need a ceramic. If you got the real God in your life. They weren't disrespectful. They were just standing there. I think we're in trouble, dude. <laughs> We'll see what happens. The soldiers are pointing at us. Don't look, don't look. <laughs> and so now they get escorted to the king. What are you guys doing? You're making me look bad. Oh, king, live forever. But we don't worship this stuff. Don't call it stuff. That's the new God. I'm on the line here publicly. Nobody defies me. You get killed. There's no second chance. But because it's you guys, let's pretend. I'm going to announce you couldn't hear me well because you were standing in the back. So let's get the musician. Oh, king, live forever. Now everybody can hear him. We worship the God of heaven. We're not going to worship the statue. Sorry, we love you, sir. Live forever. But even if we don't live forever, be it known, O oh, king, we will not worship your image. The first recorded nuclear explosion occurred that afternoon on the plain of Duda. And the king ordered the ovens heated seven times more. Have you ever done kiln work with ceramics? And it's bright red, it's so hot. The ovens were so hot that nobody could get near them. And that's when the king asked for mighty men to volunteer. Mighty men were soldiers in the armed forces of Babylon. These were the most elite troops who would gladly give their life in defense of their king. These mighty men would defy pain and would do anything their, kid, their king bids of them. And when he called for the mighty men, you know, I'm telling you, 
I've had several of my kids, friends, uh, uh, other kids that I've mentored who are United States Navy SEALs, and, and they come back to church on Saturday. I go, what happened? Why are you so sad? Well, I was in XYZ country yesterday on the other side of the planet. They flew home on an F-16 last night type of thing and, and refueled in midair. And they said, I lost one of my friends yesterday in an impossible mission. When you meet mighty men and women, they destabilize you because... We thought we understood greatness. But when you see somebody who's willing to give their life for something they believe in, and they're so heavily trained that they are the most skilled in what they do, what a combination. So the mighty men came forward, oh king, live forever. Give me your order, sir. And they bound these three guys really tight. They were hurting. Throw them into the ovens. They grabbed them and ran with them. As they burst into flames, the mighty men continued to run. Ignoring their own pain, they tossed them into the ovens and fell dead before the ovens and began to melt with the intensity of the heat. These soldiers gave their lives freely and willingly. What are we willing to die for? I mean, really, what are we willing to die for? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, you have not yet learned to live until you have found what you are willing to die for. These guys dropped dead in front of the oven, and the three guys landed inside the oven. <laughs> the coals were this big, and they lit like, like lights. And they were very light. I've never picked one of these up before. This is light. <laughs> the little sparks flying out of it. And then they noticed their ropes had burned off. And they're standing in the oven. Dude, we're in an oven, man. Now I know how the chicken feels. <laughs> their clothes hasn't burned. There are mighty men dead just right there outside the oven. And they're walking around freely among the embers and the, and the coals. And, the, and all of a sudden, a fourth guy walks in. Amen. Gentlemen. Amen. The general outside where the king, okay, let's get the musicians ready. I think we're ready to have church, right? Any questions now? Oh, king, live forever. Now what? The oven, sir. Oh, wait a second. Did we not throw three young men into the, into the furnace? Y yes, sir, we did live forever, O king. But I see one, two, three, four men walking freely in the oven. And the fourth one looks like unto the Son of God. Whenever it gets hot, whenever it gets its worst, that's when Jesus shows up. He will not forsake you. You may feel like you're alone, but he shows up. Talk all you want, get mad, but he shows up. Master, are we relieved to see you today? What did he say to them? I have to know. What did they talk about? Come here, mijo. Get over here, man. I am so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Excuse me, I'm emotional. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And then after a while, the king, who had been furious only 34 seconds ago, Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, can you hear me? And inside the oven, excuse me, Master, Oh, king, live forever. <laughs> come out, I pray you, come out. Master, I think we got to go. Andele, pues que bueno que llegó a saludarnos. <laughs> You know they had to talk some stuff, right? Because when Jesus gets serious, me siento muy orgulloso de ustedes. Amen. Mm. Anyway, they step out of the oven and tenderly walk around the bodies of these great men who gave their lives. It wasn't their fault. And they reach the king, and the king is... Come near me, I pray you. He still couldn't get close enough to the oven. And, they, and he, you guys don't even smell like smoke. 
Not even a hair is singed. I remember I was turning on the stove in the kitchen once. And, shh, shh, the flame isn't turning on. Mama, shh, it's not turning on. Shh, <laughs> my mustache. <laughs> the whole right side. I mean, we're talking about the worst case scenario. I had to even it out and not be seen in public for days. It was, oh, excuse me as I get through my traumas of life. Not even a hair was singed on these young men. And he proclaimed, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for he has spared his servants who were not willing to worship any other God than their God. I recognize him as the God above all gods. And as I'll even make a new decree. Whoever bad mouths and, and mistreats the name of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you will be cut in pieces and your houses will be destroyed with your families in them. What a quick change to the king's anger. But he didn't say, I accept him. Look how many times God is trying to reach him. And he refuses to be reached. Well, finally, the fourth chapter of Daniel. Here's what's fascinating about this one. It was written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. First time a pagan king gets to write a chapter of scripture. Ooh. Nebuchadnezzar, king unto all the people, he says, I, lying upon my bed, had a dream. And this time he saw a giant redwood sequoia tree from Northern California. He describes it. It's a tree that reached up into the heavens and disappeared in the clouds. And animals rested below its shade in its coolness. You know, that humidity with all that male fern around those giant sequoias in the avenue of the giants up 101 just south of Eureka. Ooh, you've been down there. Admit it. We drove through the tree. It was cool. And he says, one day I heard a voice saying, Cut down the tree and put a brass band around it and let seven times pass over it until he recognizes that it is God who gives kingdoms and takes away kingdoms and he is able to humble anyone. And then the king went and called Daniel. Didn't mess around with all the wise guys anymore. Tell me, man, so what's up with my dream? Oh, king, this dream is for your enemies. Live forever. No, I could take it. Tell me. Well, you're the tree, and you're not listening to God. He's been trying to reach you, and you refuse to be reached. He gave you your greatness. He gave you your majesty. He made you who you are. He gave you your power. He gave you your wealth. He gave you your wisdom, and you refuse to accept it. If you insist on this, he's going to step back, and he's going to let you taste what life is like without his blessing. He's going to honor your insistence on a godless life. And you could tell it got to him. Oh, thanks, man. Oh, oh. I need to think. And we're told here in chapter 4, exactly 12 months later, so it took a whole year for him to forget about it, he went and stood on the portico overlooking the Euphrates River. One of the seven wonders of the world was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Out there in the middle of a God-forsaken desert, you had a tropical paradise because they had channeled the river waters in such a way everything was irrigated in bright green and gorgeous. There were fresh vegetables and fruits growing right in the city. And he stood on his porch and he says, Is this not the great Babylon that I built with the might of my hand for the glory of my name and for my majesty? And suddenly a voice was heard from the heavens, Hew down the tree and let seven times pass over until he recognized that it is God who gives kingdoms and takes kingdoms and he has the ability to humble anybody. And at that moment, he lost his sanity. God didn't do it to him. He did it to himself. God told him, if you insist, I'm just going to step back and honor your wishes and you're going to see how fearsome it is not to have my blessing in your life. He went insane, but because the prime minister, Daniel, knew 
the dream. He protected the kingdom because everybody else wanted to be king. Guess where Nebuchadnezzar stayed? In a barn. He ate wheat, uh, hay, with the donkeys. His nails grew out. And his hair kind of did this. And he was insane. He lost his reason. He was unable to function among humans. The greatest king on earth was in a barn. And seven times passed over him. Seven years. And here, here's the powerful part of the story as we conclude the last meeting of the Breakthrough Series here in Tacoma, Washington. Verse 34 of chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar in his hand says, And at the end of those years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes unto heaven. And my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored Him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. He finally looked heavenward and recognized that there is a God who wants to bless him. After seven years of sticking to his guns among the animals, having it out with a donkey over who gets that last piece of hay, he now looks heavenward. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing he does according to his will in the army of heaven. At that moment, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor, my brightness returned unto me. My counselors and my lords sought me again. And I was established in my kingdom again. An excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, extol, and honor the King of heaven. All whose works are truth, his ways are judgment. And whoever is proud, he is able to humble him. He accepted God. God doesn't give up that easy. Um, has he been searching for you? You've been found. Like my dad used to say, you can run me home, but you can't hide. I'll catch up to you. My legs are longer than yours. Sure enough, I tried it once. My dad's legs were longer than mine. So was his belt. No, I'm just kidding. I, uh, I'm just... No, don't take... No, no, child protect... No, don't worry. I, um, um, that was just a moment of joy. God finally reached him. He first tried through a health message. But he didn't respond. Others do respond with a health message. Praise the Lord. And he tried through prophecy, telling them what is to come, up right up to the coming of Jesus. It, it, many right there except the Lord. Right there, that's enough. The prophecies were enough to persuade them. Yes, it, it, but not him. Then he tried through worship, it, through, through a service. It, it, it was almost enough, but not quite. And it wasn't until God finally said, all right, you insist. Let me step back. Now taste life without me. In his mercy, he had been sustaining him. But God will eventually honor your requests and your demands, and you could taste what life without him can be. Don't ever be without God again in your life. That's not a religious thing. That's a faith thing. People of faith are what is written in this book. When you have faith, then God can bless you. God can teach you all truth when you now understand the experience of faith. God did not give up until he reached Nebuchadnezzar. So he's not going to give up on you. You see, it's not about you and I finding God. It's God not giving up until he finds us. We have been here along the Puget Sound this week. It has been my great honor to stand here with you each night worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We have talked about faith in new ways. 
Perhaps the traditions of a few have been challenged, but it was never out of disrespect. It's just that we must look at the reality of this. God must become a true Savior, a personal Lord and Savior in your life who forgives you of sins and cleanses you of unrighteousness. He has to rise above the arguments of doctrine to the experience of doctrine in your life. So if you're going to take care of your body, take care of it for the right reasons. If you're going to live in the understanding the prophecies, understand them with the right motives. We are not better than anyone. We have this precious truth to guide us along the way. You see, that's when it makes sense when He calls on you to experience it. Now, I want you to see tonight what it looks like when people make these commitments. It's simple. There's nothing complex. I want you to see what baptism looks like. These are people who have been coming to the Breakthrough Series and have made decisions for Jesus in their lives. Sage, because you have made this determination in your life to have a new beginning, to be reborn, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is our joy as ministers of the Gospel to baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The Lord tonight makes it clear that faith is a simple thing. It's not as complicated as it seems. You simply choose to believe God. What do we believe in in society anymore? We've become such a skeptical society that we come to believe in nothing. And when you choose to believe in God, and then you understand more and more for the rest of your life his teachings for your life, then it's more than religion. That is what faith looks like. My dear Taloa, you have come to the presence of God Almighty tonight, determined, for he has found you too. And you choose to walk with him from this day forward. It is our joy as ministers of the gospel to baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, in Jesus Christ, His Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm going to sing this song. Praise the Lord. And as I'm singing, if the Lord has called upon you, if the Lord has called you the way He called Nebuchadnezzar, this week He's tried to reach you through this way, through that way, He never gives up. The bottom line is that he loves you. It's just a simple choice. I don't want you to feel guilty and this is not an emotional moment. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. This is a reasonable thing. If your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. As I sing this song, and you want the Lord in your life, come on up here so we can pray together in this last meeting together. Others of you know that God is calling you to prepare for baptism. If that is the case, you come on up as well. Come as I sing this song. There is singing up in heaven Such as we have never known Where the angels sing the praises Of the Lamb upon the throne Yes, their harps are ever tuneful And their voice is always clear Oh, that we might be more like them As we serve the Master here They sing holy
Come through many trials, battles fought and victories won. All for Him who has redeemed us and has said to us, "Well done." They sing, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb." They sing. calling you too? Has the Lord been searching for you too? Anyone else? Let's bow our heads together and as we pray, it is appropriate for anyone else that God is calling to come on up. Father in heaven, thank you for not giving up on Nebuchadnezzar and his greatest days came after his conversion. Lord, what will you do with our lives as well? This is reasonable. And now, as the Breakthrough Series comes to an end, we have truly experienced a breakthrough this week, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. This has been a breakthrough moment. Go in peace. <laughs>